Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about DNA replication. That's the process by which DNA makes a copy of itself. Why is that important? Well, this right here is an egg being fertilized by a sperm. That means it's about to become a zygote. It'll divide through mitosis to eventually create an embryo, a fetus, and eventually create a human. And that human is going to have billions and trillions of cells. And we have to make sure that each of those cells has the same exact DNA that was in that original cell. And we do that through the process of DNA replication. If we were to point specifically where that occurs, well, in eukaryotic cells, like this little baby here, that cell cycle basically is remember the G1 phase where it grows, the S phase where we copy all the DNA, the G2 phase where it continues to grow. So this whole process right here is called interphase. We then have uh, mitosis where we go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. But right here, we have to make sure during that S phase that we copy all of the DNA. Now, mitosis is not found in, in prokaryotes, but they're going to use a process called binary fission. And if you look right here, here's their nucleoid region. They'll copy their DNA perfectly before they split in half. And so in all life on our planet, DNA replication is super important. And so basically, when they figured out the structure of DNA, three theories came about as to how it actually makes copies of itself. The first is semi-conservative, conservative, and dispersive. Watson and Crick actually believed in this. They believed that DNA would split in half, and then you copy new strands on either side. But there are other scientists who believe in a conservative theory that that first DNA remains intact, and it kind of makes a photocopy of itself. And then some believe that there was kind of a combination of uh, conservative and semi-conservative, that chunks of it were being split between the two. And this had to do with, they thought, uh, the histone proteins and how the DNA wrapped around it. And so basically, the whole thing was figured out through the messelson stahl experiment. Basically, what they used was two different types of nitrogen, good old run-of-the-mill nitrogen-14, and then nitrogen-15, an isotope that's heavier than nitrogen-14. So basically, they bred a bunch of E. coli on nitrogen-15 until all of their DNA was nitrogen-15. They then put them on a broth of nitrogen-14, and basically, in that first generation, if it would have been conservative, we would have had one band that would have been totally heavy at this N15 line, and then one that was at N14. But instead, we got this uh, intermediary amount of DNA. In other words, it was a mix of the two. And then through generation after generation after generation, they were able to figure out that this is how DNA copies itself. It, it copies itself semi-conservatively. And so to look at that in a little better detail, basically here is your DNA. It's a double helix. It will unzip in the middle, so you can see it's unwinding right here. And then we're going to add new strands on either side. So we eventually start with, or excuse me, we start with one strand, and we're going to end up with two strands. Each of these strands are identical to that first strand, and each of them are going to contain half of that original DNA. So again, it's semi-conservative in nature. Before we actually talk about the process of DNA replication, we should talk about DNA and the parts of DNA. Remember, DNA is going to have three parts to it. You're basically going to have a sugar. That would be this deoxyribose sugar right here. I can circle it. This is going to be our deoxyribose sugar. You're going to have a nitrogenous base attached to that. And then you're going to have a phosphate group. And so there are three parts to every nucleotide. Again, we've got a sugar and a phosphate and then a nitrogenous base. But you can see that there's going to be another nucleotide right here and another nucleotide going to be found right here. So let me clean that up a little bit. Because it's anti-parallel in nature. In other words, DNA runs next to each other, so it's parallel, but it's anti-parallel in nature. In other words, the two strands of DNA are actually running in the opposite direction. And when I mean running, I mean chemically running in either direction. So basically, how do we tell which way it's going? Well, we do that based on the sugar. And so if we look at the sugar right here, the sugar is going to have a carbon here. So we call that carbon the one prime carbon. It's going to have a carbon right here, and we call that the two prime carbon. It's going to have a carbon right there. We call that the three prime carbon. It's going to have a carbon right there called the four prime, and then it's going to have a carbon right here, and that's called the five prime. And so basically, if you look here, that whole thing is going to run from the let's look way down here one two three prime end. Oops, let me go back. So that's going to run from the one two three prime end right here all the way up to the five prime end over here, because here's that five prime. If we look on the other side of the DNA, you can see it's running the opposite direction from the three prime to the five prime. And that's going to be important when we look at DNA and how it copies itself. And so let's look at that. If we look on the next slide. In DNA replication, there are tons and tons and tons of enzymes that are helping out. It's way more complex than this, but from a diagram level, this is pretty good. So basically, the DNA is going to be a double helix in this direction, but we're going to have this enzyme right here. It's called helicase, and it's basically going to unwind the DNA. So we're going to go from this double helix to these single... Um single strands of DNA on either side. These strands are going to be held in place using these enzymes. They're called single strand binding proteins. They're basically going to hold it in place. And so now we have that unwound DNA. The big enzyme that's super important here is called DNA polymerase. So if we look on this side, DNA polymerase is going to race down the DNA and it's going to add new nucleotides on the other side of the DNA. So here's the original strand. And you can see that DNA polymerase has already been here because it's added new strands in this direction. Now the trick is that we can only add new nucleotides on the three prime end. We can't add it on the five prime end. And so basically again, so here's the five prime end. If we follow that right down here, we can add DNA on this side, on the three prime end, and it's just going to go on silky smooth. In other words, helicase unwinds it, DNA polymerase adds the new letters. And on this side, we call that the leading strand. Everything's going to be perfect. It's just going to flow on there perfectly. But the problem is, since we can only add DNA on the three prime end, we can't add it up here. We can't add it on the five prime end over here. And so what's evolved is this really elegant method called the lagging strand. So we can finish out the other side. And it's a lagging strand because it tends to lag behind the other side. Um, if you've done any sewing, which I never have, it's kind of like backstitching. In other words, you're going in this direction, but you're backstitching the way as you go. And so basically, there are a number of different parts that are found in here. First thing that we have to do is we have to put down a primer. And so there's going to be DNA, excuse me, RNA primase, and primase is going to add down a primer. Primer is just one little bit of RNA. So we'll add a little bit of an RNA first. And after we've added that RNA primer, then DNA polymerase can go in this direction. So once the primer's in place. Then we can run in that direction. We can run in that direction. We can keep running in that direction. So we've got a little RNA down, then DNA polymerase goes. Unfortunately, it can't connect it here because we've got DNA bumping into RNA. And so there's going to be another enzyme. And that enzyme is called, uh, let me find it, DNA ligase. And so basically, what DNA ligase is going to do is it's going to go after that and it's going to clean up all these messy junctions here and it's going to put DNA straight across it. And so basically, that's a lot of stuff going on. What is all of that doing? It's making sure that that message that was found in the DNA is copied to that two new strands of DNA on either side. And there's some vi videos out on YouTube about how DNA replication works and they put together some computer animations of it and it's wild. It doesn't look like this at all. You have the lagging strand coming back upon itself. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Or you could even read the story of Okazaki, the person who came up with this idea of how these Okazaki fragments work. Another fascinating story, but we got to finish. And so basically what I want to talk about is origins of replication or where DNA replication starts. Well, in life, there are basically two life uh, types. We've got the prokaryotics, which is going to be the bacteria and the archaea, and then the eukaryotics, and that's going to be like you. And if you're prokaryotic, you're going to have a single loop of DNA. This is actually a plasmid, but it looks the same way. You have a strand of DNA in a perfect loop. And so for them, they can just simply start copying it on this side. The origin of replication is at one point. They move around, and eventually what they'll have is two strands of DNA. It's going to be an exact copy of that. And again, in binary fission, those become different cells. But in us, we have such a long DNA
of those replication forks, we call it, but there'll be another replication fork at the other side. And also in eukaryotic cells, we'll have multiple sites of, uh, or multiple origins of replication. So we'll have one here, we'll have one here, we'll have one here. In other words, when we're copying the DNA, it's going to start copying in another, in a bunch of different uh, points. And then those replication forks will move towards each other until we eventually have two strands of DNA. And so again, DNA replication is super important. It's incredibly accurate, rarely makes mistakes. And I hope that was helpful.